Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. Well, thank you for being here, David. You're uh, welcome. So let's, uh, let's start off with, um, you're the co-writer on this project. How did this story come about, and why did you want to tell it? Uh, uh, Joel, <clears throat> Joel Edgerton um, is one of my best friends. Uh, we live... We live about two minutes walk from each other in Sydney. We see each other all the time. Um, <clears throat> he was having a meeting with, this was years ago, maybe six, seven years ago. He was having a meeting at a, another studio about, um, they wanted him to play the lead in a, a, a kind of sort of cartoony, historical epic thing, um, which he didn't want to do. Um, <clears throat> and in the course of that meeting, he just kind of, he just threw up the idea of maybe uh, of doing some form of he the story of Henry V. He had played Hal on stage in the Shakespeare, uh, um, in Shakespeare, Shakespeare productions of uh, Henry IV, parts one and two, and Henry V. Um, and had, I think, and he was fresh out of drama school. I think they were seminally important creative experiences for him. You know, he did a hundred performances of all three plays all around Australia, and um, it, was a, it was a much acclaimed performance. Uh, I didn't know him then. Anyway, he, uh, when he came to me with the idea, um, I, it rubbed me the wrong way the first time I heard it. I mean, only because it's Shakespeare, you know? It's like you're just asking for trouble. <laughs> I knew we, I mean, I, I think we knew very quickly we didn't want to do a straight adaptation. We didn't want to do a straight adaptation of the plays. Um, not just for formal reasons, uh, you know, it's like that, but there were formal reasons. You know, that, that text, as glorious as it is, is written to be perform presented on an Elizabethan stage. You know, it's, it's, it, it doesn't lend itself... Uh, naturally to, you know, the kind of sort of big brooding medieval movie we thought we, were, we might make. But also for political and thematic reasons, you know, it's, it's, I, I think it would be pretty hard to make a straight adaptation of that play today. You know, it is, it's, it is, it is, it, it, it's hard to keep clear of the nationalist, nationalistic bombast of it, you know, that, that it is the story of a young, uh, you know, kind of warrior king, and you know he's got conscience issues to grapple with. But uh, but it, it's the story of his kind of glorious victory over France, and you know, and most telling, it's in in the, is in the scene at the end of Henry V between Hal and Catherine of Valois. Um, you know that it it plays really strangely at the end of the play. It's like a a twenty minute scene. Joel talks about this a lot. It was always felt really odd. In some ways, it felt like a it felt like a palate cleanser at the end of the play. You know, she he's just invaded her country. He gets given her as a prize, and they flirt with each other for twenty minutes, and then in the end, you know, and it's just like we can't make that version of this. Um, and so we came, you know, we came across, we actually, st we actually also started to see really interesting parallels, this is a testament to the power of Shakespeare, interesting parallels that could be drawn between the stuff going on in that play, uh, or those plays, and, you know, particularly kind of contemporary White House administrations, you know. <laughs> Of both persuasions, you know, you could draw parallels with a kind of, you know, a, a, an obvious sort of George W., you know, a naive president with a cabal of sort of circling neocon sharks pushing him into an illegitimate war. But you could also, you could, uh, we found it, you know, you could, you could draw parallels to an Obama administration, you know, it was like a genuinely well-intentioned man thinking he was going to do the job better, clean up the mess that had been left behind, but then coming to discover that the machine is too powerful, you know, and that you can get isolated in it. And that was the kind of, that was the version of this thing that we wanted to tell, was the, 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 the kind of the genuinely well-intentioned young man coming in, taking on this 
incredible this position of incredible responsibility and power at a very young age and then suddenly feeling isolated alone paranoid and then drifting almost unwittingly into a kind of tyranny you yeah. you touched on it a bit but um the idea that you did this writing with the i with Shakespeare in mind, but also the historical factors. Can you talk a little bit about the intertwining of that and the importance of um, uh, Sir John's character? Well, yeah, so we made the decision really early on to push Shakespeare to the side, knowing we were never going to be able to do it completely because, uh, you know, I mean, because of the character Joel plays principally, yeah. you know. Uh, Falstaff is a Shakespearean conceit, possibly, arguably one of the great, of the greatest of Shakespeare's characters. We, we were going to hang on to that, so we kind of knew that we would be dragging Shakespeare around with us wherever we went from that point on. But so we just cherry-picked a few kind of basic kind of flagpoles and then did a deep dive. You know, it's, I lo it's one of the things I love about this job is that for I get, I get, I get given these very abstract assignments for a couple of years you know, and dive into... Uh, medieval history for a couple of years and cherry pick some of that and then make some of our own stuff up and uh, and yeah so in the, but we we always knew you know we when we flirted with the idea of changing Falstaff's name but it's like you know anyone who knows the Henry ad is going to know that we've is going to know where that's from um, <clears throat> but yeah so it was uh it, yeah, it was. It's. I'm still talking about Shakespeare to this day. <laughs> now you have an amazing young um, ensemble for this film. Can you talk a little bit about how uh, Timothy, Robert, and Lily all ended up um, being a part of this picture? Rob, because I have, I had. I mean, one of the things we loved about doing this when you think about the the, the Shakespeare adaptations, uh, the or you know, say Kenneth Branagh's adaptation or the Laurence Olivier, whatever you, you know. I mean, I think I think Kenneth Branagh was twenty nine when he played the character, but he felt older to me. We really loved the idea of being true to the ages of these characters, you know. That, I mean, it's because that, in a way, for us, this is what was extraordinary about the story: is how young these people were. Um, uh, Henry V was, you know, in his mid twenties when he became king. Technically, Ben Mendelsohn is too old to play Henry IV. Henry IV was forty-five when he died. Um, Rob Pattinson, I had worked with on my second movie, The Rover. I really loved, I love working with Rob. I love, I just think he's a phenomenally talented actor. And he was, I think, the first person that we cast, um, aside from Joel, um, because I just, I just had this feeling he would have fun playing that character. <laughs> uh, and I and I and I and I believe that at that point in the movie, the movie needs an injection of something else. You know, it needs um, it needs some f some f some flavour at, at that point. <laughs> and it was also really important to me that character. Like, it's kind of he's kind of an, an absurd villain in a way. But it was very, given the important. It was so important to me that it become apparent to Hal at the end of the movie that this war that he's waged this catastrophe that he's unleashed was all because he was basically, in a way, being taunted by a jerk, you know? And so it was really important to me that that character be almost a kind of a surface presentation of douchebaggery or something, <laughs> you know? That there not be a huge, like a huge amount of substance underneath it. It's just they're like two kids taunting each other. Um, yeah, and Lily Rose. Uh, Lily Rose was uh, she was the f she was the first first audition I saw for Catherine, uh, and I just thought she was. Uh, and then I went, I, you know, you have you do, you do that thing where you if some if you're the first audition you see for a character is really great, you think it's because the writing is amazing, <laughs> and so you go, well, okay, I want to see what other people can do. Um, and so I tested a whole lot of other people, and then went back to Lily Rose and. And, and, you know, kind of, I started to realise what it was about her that is, what it was about her personally that lent itself so perfectly to the character. It was, 
I think a te- like a product of her own childhood. You know, she has she's so young, but she's so beautifully poised. She's such a wonderful human, um, and you know, she's grown up with a kind of a form of royalty around her, and she's but has has come out the end of that perfectly level-headed. Yeah. You know, which is incredibly admirable. Now, this is a time period of um, strong masculinity, and the story is very much um, a masculine story. But what I like what you do is your female characters are very strong, and they're outspoken, especially uh, Lily's character of Catherine um, being the wise um, wise person to finally open up at the end and be like, hey, you're an idiot for doing this. Um, can you talk a little bit about putting such strong female characters? I have become aware, uh, I've become aware probably quite late in the game that, um, uh, I mean, it's because it's kind of blindingly obvious that I seem, I seem to make, uh, I seem to make movies about, um, basically about either delusional or naive men moving in a toxic soup of men. Uh, but, you know, and and uh, an either naive or delusional man in the middle of it coming to realise that he's wrong, you know. Um, and in those worlds, I don't know what it is about these worlds. It's either because I am that delusional man, or because it is these worlds of delusional men that frighten me. But uh, I I always start fi- trying looking at where where do women fit in this little this little toxic soup. And the nature of the toxic soup always pushes them to the periphery, you know, just that's what it does. But it uh, always feels important to me, you know, it's, I, I did it with Tilda Swinton and Meg Tilly in my last movie, War Machine, and uh, Gillian Jones and Susan Pryor in The Rover. And I mean, Animal Kingdom's different because Jackie Weaver's just the toxic thing at the centre of that one, <laughs> but... Um, and again, in this one, it was like I, I loved the idea of you know uh, how in real life, in true history, had a, a younger sister named Philippa who was married off to Eric of Pomerania. She was herself the Queen of Denmark, but she was very young. I loved the idea of her coming back into the fold just for a couple of days, but having already been privy to the workings of a whole other court and just giving him a just. A, a, a sounding a warning for him and ditto for Lily Rose you know for Catherine having been a, around a court for a long time and and the idea being that by being pushed to the periphery of this toxic soup you can look in at it with a, a an objectivity um, yeah Can you uh, talk a little bit about the scene between Hal and Catherine and how um, you frame it in a way that it's, they're playing, it's like the battle of the minds. They're sitting across from each other. It's as if there was a chessboard sitting in front of them and they're playing that strategy and it's all in the mind games. Can you talk a little bit about um, shooting that scene and the importance between those two as actors and their characters? Uh, It was... I was really nervous. We shot that scene quite early in the shoot. I was really nervous shooting it because I knew that, you know, in a, in a, way, in a way that, you know, come the, the end of the Battle of Agincourt, the movie is kind of sort of, you should, it's time to wrap it up, you know. And I knew that <laughs> I was, uh, what I, was in the script that we'd written was three, if you include the scene with her father, uh, King Charles, played by Thibaut de Montalembert, beautiful French actor. Um, uh, but we were ending the movie with three quite long dialogue scenes. Uh, and so I was nervous if those scenes didn't land. I felt like everything we were doing in the movie was designed to deliver you to those last scenes. And so I was nervous uh, shooting them. I mean, you know, they're two very young actors, uh, but so glorious, so beautifully talented. You know, we got there very quickly to a place that I... I it started to feel magical to me. And then it was about, you know, I wanted to, I mean, I don't know how technically you want to get, but I, I was, you know, in the edit, it was always very, it was important to me. I wanted to, this is Timmy's kind of world coming apart. You know, he's become the king in his mind. I like that he saunters into this room 
I love he does a little cough when he walks in, like, you know, whatever, everything. I've won, I've come to meet my prize wife, my trophy wife, you know. And then she starts breaking him down. And, um, and so I always wanted to keep him a little bit wider, keep him in mid-shot the whole time, just let, what, let him watch him, don't give him a seat with a back, watch him just start to crumple in on himself. Let, the, let Lily have the big close-ups when she starts calling him on the absurdity of, you know, are you suggesting on some level that this war was about a ball, you yeah. know? Um, save Timmy's close-up for the very end in that big profile shot when you just go, uh, it's just to suggest that his brain is shifting gears very radically. Take him into the next room with Sean Harris, William, played by Sean Harris, and then all very quickly get straight into Timmy's close-ups and just let him sit in close-up the whole time. L like, put him back in charge of that scene in some way. Uh, yeah. I, I, I really, you know, they were really hard. That last scene with Sean Harris was really difficult to shoot. You know, I think we all had put so much expectation on it. Um, it has very tricky stuff to navigate, you know. It's, in a way, it's like... It's Hal is catching William out in a lie. But William's too stupid to let himself get caught. And so... <laughs> but I needed it to still function that way, you know. So in a way, it's... it's um, ha William's playing along with the... Um, being caught in the lie is... He's, he's done knowingly. He does it with a, with a kind of defiance. And it's not until he explodes at the end of the scene. It's the first time in the, in, in the movie, probably the first time in his whole adult life that he, that character, has lost control. And the second he loses control, he signs his own death warrant. And yeah, exactly. Now, um, can you uh, talk a little bit about your locations um, and where, where the battle took place and where you shot the battle scene? Um, we, shot, we shot for a month in England, uh, mainly for architecture. And then went, took the whole circus to Hungary um, for landscape. I mean, you know, a little bit because it's cheaper to shoot there. This was a big movie and uh, we needed it to make it efficiently. Um, but also because I had already done some scouting in England and I was, you know, England being England, it's very small, it's very densely populated, it's very rich and therefore it feels very manicured. And there was something about, as soon as we had a look in Hungary, I just loved, it just feels wilder. It feels like an older Europe. Um, uh, and, but it wasn't fun. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't, it was the middle of, it was the middle of summer. The, like the Battle of Agincourt we shot in two weeks. Okay. Uh, we really could have used another three. <laughs> Um, it, was, it was like 110 degrees every day and the mud was disgusting and every, it was, it was uh, everything about it was unpleasant. <laughs> we prepped so carefully. I was so... We, we were all nervous about it from months out and I prepped, I prepped it more carefully than I've ever prepped anything before in my life. And my secret hope was that because we'd prepped it so thoroughly that we would get there. And I, actually, it, all, it was all fine. But actually, it was 10 times worse than I was <laughs> anticipating. Um, and, but I think shooting it that quickly, I think you can feel it on the screen. You know, I knew that I wanted to shoot it in a way that f I didn't want it to turn into a, a you know, a, a typical kind of period battle scene where it's either totally incomprehensible or you know, it's all crane shots and drone shots and I wanted to be in there, in it. Yeah. I wanted to feel the... I mean, it, it was apparently true that most people who died at Agincourt died from being um, trampled or drowned in the mud. Um, and so I wanted to feel the... the, um, the I wanted to f feel the, the suffocating claustrophobia of it. Yeah, that actually brings me to my next question was, um, I was going to say, you do this wonderful thing where you shoot the battle, where you're putting everybody at eye level, the audience at eye level, um, so they can follow the character that they need to follow, but also make them feel as if they're watching a sporting event off to the side um, of, of the clashes. Can you talk about that decision instead of doing drone shots and crane shots? 
Yeah, exactly. It was uh, it was important. So it was really I, that location we found to shoot the battle was about three hours outside of Budapest, uh, um, which was very inconvenient for the production. <laughs> But I had been looking and looking and looking. It was, I, had, I, had this, I had a very specific thing in my mind. I wanted a hill the French could be on. I wanted, their, I wanted it to feel like it was in a little bit of a, 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 a bowl, yeah. you know. Um, because I wanted, I wanted to be able to... I, I knew I didn't want to have cameras up on cranes. I knew I didn't want to have drones. But I wanted to be able to feel like you're looking... So when Hal's up in the forest, I wanted to feel like he's up in the stands of a stadium looking down on it and um and ditto for the dauphin you know uh looking down on the battle but at this but all the while f to whatever extent possible keeping um keeping it everything feeling like it's come it's at human eye level you know this is i wanted because i wanted the battle to feel like a some an organic extension of the rest of the movie i didn't want it to suddenly turn into uh some other thing, yeah. Now, can we talk a little bit about the costumes and that you actually used um, actual um, armor and and how did that work with sound design for the for the film? Because you would think you would be having yeah. hear a lot of clinging. Yeah, it was a nightmare for the sound department. <laughs> I really wanted to, whenever possible, and obviously they can't fight in the real stuff. I mean, they could, and people did once upon a time, but they also got injured once upon a time. Um, you have these polyurethane things made, but you have to cast them from real suits. Uh, and, uh, and so we had the real suits made. We made them traditionally. And so I was like, we've gone to all this trouble to make these things, you know, and they're beautiful. And you can tell the difference. Um, so whenever it was a scene of like you know Joel and Timmy, for instance, that their last proper dialogue scene together when Falstaff's have, having his armor put on, and um, I wanted Joel to wear his real suit, but it does mean that he's clanking and all you know it is. It's it's a it's a sound nightmare, but I, I love it. I just love I love the reminder of the fact that these people are fighting to the death wearing you know trash cans, you know, <laughs> that they can barely see out of. And, um, you know, how terrifying that would be. But you have to do it, you know. You've got to just try and protect every... Uh, I just, I, you know, it's also very important to me, you know, that the, the fight earlier in the movie when Hal and Hotspur fight, you know, I really wanted that to feel like two kids in trash cans just beating the hell out of each other. And that like any schoolyard fight, pretty quickly they just end up on the ground, you know. You can, you've, you've done all your training, uh, you swing your swords at each other fa in a fancy way for, you know, maybe 15, 20 seconds, but pretty quickly you're just gonna be rolling around on the ground bashing the hell out of each other. Yeah. And heaving for breath. And um, I noticed that this could be a lot gorier of a film in the battle scenes. You, it feels like you made a conscious effort to not show blood and obviously the beheading and stuff that was, but for like the battle scene and stuff, most war um, and medieval films will show a lot more um, limbs being removed and a lot more blood. Can you talk a little bit about your choice of not doing that? Well, again, as I say, it was a little bit out of our, you know, there, there have been forensic archaeological studies of the battlefield at, at Agincourt, and, you know, because famously the English won that battle even though they were so grossly outnumbered and it was partly because the French, you know, we've engineered it so it was like some kind of stroke of full staffy and strategic genius. But <laughs> it was, you know, actually, you know, they, they, they had a lot more, the French had a lot more fully armoured knights um, and the ground was so muddy that um, you, you know, in these forensic studies, you can see them, you can see them on YouTube, they're kind of amazing. You, you know, the, you put a fully armored shoe into this foot deep mud and it's really difficult to su pull it back out again. But if uh, you're wearing a, a kind of a medieval leather shoe, as m most of the English were, because they sent their archers and, and uh, less armoured men at arms out onto the field wearing leather shoes, you can pull it out. Anyway, so if you're wearing a full suit of armour, you're and you fall over in that mud, you're not getting back up again. Yeah. 
Um, most people who died died from being, you know, drowned or trampled. Uh, and, you know, and to be honest, when I see those fight scenes in medieval movies where, you know, there's like slow motion slash of a sword and blood goes flying, I just never believe it. It just pulls me out of the uh, experience. The horror of it for me was the was the the, the claustrophobia of it, you know. Uh, th that stuff of, especially with Joel, just getting sucked in. And Joel will say this, uh, he was frightened when we were shooting it, you know. Yeah. He, was, he was wearing a polyurethane suit, but it was still really uncomfortable, really heavy, really muddy. And, you know, he, there are stunt guys around him, but uh, there's, th you know, 300 of them yeah. and horses and who knows what the hell they're going to do. And there were a couple of moments where he went down and couldn't get back up again and he was... He was you know, and I've and he and he expressed his <laughs> anger, and I never see I never see Joel express anger. I knew he was in distress when he was doing that because I've known him a long time and I never know him to get angry. But I, I don't think he's angry at me. <laughs> no, I um I need to ask you about the catapults because I expected CGI catapults um, from when I saw... So did I. <laughs> yes. Uh, can you talk a little bit how you ended up with actual catapults? Um, trebuchets, they're technically called. Uh, I, I don't know, man. It was like... I had, we had a meeting a very early on in pre-production where, you know, it was the art, classic art department meeting and everyone was going, you know... Uh, so, the trebuchets, how many do you want? And I'll go... Uh, three, thinking maybe I would eventually be told that I could have one or maybe half of one and it would have to be that, you know. Uh, and then we never talked about it again. <laughs> and then I turned up months later on set and here were these amazing things that were, uh, had been, you know, we did, we did talk about it because I needed to work out where to put them. And, but the, every time it did come up, it never came up with, all right, so sorry to have to tell you this. It was always like, okay, so I always expected that conversation to be, okay, here's the one where I get told where I can only have one. And it never happened. I just, uh, I don't know where they are now either. You know? <laughs> I was going to ask, do you have one? But <laughs> no, my, 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 my partner and I have built... Uh, a little shack on her um, parents' farm up in Queensland in the north of Australia. And there's a paddock there that's just, I just, every time I look at this paddock, I go, there should be a trebuchet <laughs> sitting in the middle of that thing. Well, David, thank you so much for being here. Uh, I truly appreciate it. Wonderful film. Thank, thank you, you all for, for having coming. me very much. Thank you.